Let me pray. God, thank you so much for uh, your word and for these truths that we even get to sing uh, about your greatness that is incomprehensible, uh, how we get to gather together week after week and reflect on your character, your works, your marvelous deeds that we don't deserve to have revealed to us and much less be the beneficiaries of. God, I pray that uh, as we hear your word now that you would uh, produce clarity uh, from me as I preach from uh, or in the minds of those who hear that we would uh, gain increasing clarity on the things that you've revealed in the amazing text that we'll be in tonight. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, perhaps you, uh, you, you didn't know this, but there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters, and five of those letters have what they call a uh, final form, creating a, a total of 27 different shapes, forms in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, the, the group of, of writers, or translators rather, um, these group of men called the Masoretes. Um, the Masoretes, they, uh, they were called the masters of the tradition because they sought to carry on the work of previous scribes. So these people came along about 500 years after Christ. Uh, they sought to preserve the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and we are greatly indebted to them. One observation that they made about Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, which is where we'll be uh, tonight in Zephaniah 3, 8, they noted that this was the only verse in the entire Hebrew Bible that included every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, including those final forms. That has nothing to do with the meaning of the text. But I do think it's interesting. So if you're interested in learning Hebrew or perhaps wanting to practice writing, then you should use Zephaniah 3.8 as, uh, as practice. Tonight we'll be jumping into Zephaniah 3.8. This is really the descent of this prophetic writing. And in Zephaniah 3.8, we are called as uh, this original audience or subsequent readers uh, looking for God's instruction, they're called to do one thing primarily, and that is to wait. Called to wait. Here in this text, and we'll be looking all the way through verse 13, waiting is the preeminent duty of all those who are willing to hear. All those who have an ear to hear are being told to intentionally, contentedly resign themselves to God's character and care while they anticipate his definitive future activity. That's one way to think about what waiting is biblically. The person who is waiting on God is intentionally and contentedly resigning themselves to God's care anticipating his definitive work in the future. And this is what we are helped to do by this text, Zephaniah 3, 8 through 13. Let me read that for us from the New American Standard. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger. For all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. For then I will give to the people's purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. To that day, in that day, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. 
For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths when they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Here in this passage, the day of the Lord includes five future events motivating God's people to wait. The day of the Lord includes five future events motivating God's people to wait. All of the events that we'll see here occur on what Zephaniah has been honing in on, calling the day of the Lord, that period of time in human history when Yahweh pours out his wrath on the world, and then as we'll see, subsequent to pouring out that wrath, brings about several other future events. Let me just show you uh, some indicators, if you were wondering if All of these things happened at the same time. If some of them were past, some future, we'll actually see that there are indicators in the text that say all of these events happen on the same, quote unquote, day or the same period of time. In verse eight, we see that word that we've seen many times in the book, day. For the day when I rise up as a witness. So this first event occurs on that day. And then in verse 9, for then, another time marker, then or at that time, I will give to the people's purified lips. So another event happens then or at that time. Verse 11 again says, in that day, you will feel no shame. So we're talking about the same period of time. And then finally, verse 13, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. That last conjunction you get to uh, probably translated for in the English, for then they will feed, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Uh, That's another time marker indicating that what's being described in those final two lines of verse 13 is happening uh, contemporary to all the other things that have been described. And we'll talk about why that is in a bit. But all of that to say that these events that God brings about, he's bringing them about in the same period of time called the day of the Lord. Also helpful to note, this is, again, a continuation of the word of the Lord. This is something being declared This is an announcement being made by God. You see in verse 8, therefore wait for me, declares Yahweh. And we've seen that in other portions of the book. Just look again at chapter 1, verse 2. This declares Yahweh or announces the Lord. We saw in verse 2, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. That's the first instance. Again, in verse 3, this is mentioned at the end of verse 3, that he will remove man and beast, remove birds of the sky, fish of the sea, ruins along with the wicked, cut off from the face of the earth, uh, man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. So God is announcing these things. Then again in verse 10, the same phrase, on that day, verse 10, declares Yahweh, there will be a sound of a cry from the fish gate, etc. So these are things that God has declared. Even the ruin of the nations, chapter 2, verse 9, again, another announcement or declaration made by God himself. Therefore, as I live, declares Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, and then says what will become of Moab and Ammon. Similar to all of those instances, here again, 
God is making it undeniable, clear that this is his own announcement. These future events, just as surely as everything else that's been said up to this point about the day of the Lord, just as surely as those things would happen, as surely as it was God himself announcing them through the prophet Zephaniah, here again, these other events that unfold on the day of the Lord are also declared or announced by God himself. And so everything that we'll discuss tonight that we'll hear about that's coming in the future, you can bank on these things happening. They're they're happening. They will happen with absolute certainty. God will make it unmistakably clear. And all of those who believe these words will not be disappointed. And so we have five future events that really motivate us, encourage us as God's people to wait the same way that they did with this initial audience hearing these words. Anybody who was going to believe Zephaniah, who was eager to receive the instruction coming from God through him, is being called in this portion of the prophecy to do one thing primarily, and that is to wait. The first event that we're taught to wait on is God's justice. Event number one is God's justice. Therefore, verse eight, wait for me, wait for me. As we talk about these events, beginning with God's justice that are coming even future to us, the believer in God's promises is not primarily waiting on the thing or on the event to occur. Or another way to think about this is to wait on the event is primarily to have in view God himself acting. It's not like, hey, history is going to happen anyway. Let's just get on with it. When's it coming? I'm just going to wait for that thing to come. No, God says primarily all of these things that are that can be anticipated are a waiting on God himself. Wait for me, not primarily the event. All of these events, God himself is causing to come to fruition. So the person who is anticipating the events themselves can legitimately be said to be waiting on the Lord. And the first thing that we are waiting on from this text is God's justice. This is the day when God himself says he will rise up as a witness Indeed, his decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them his indignation, all his burning anger. This day is coming. This is what we've been talking about for weeks now that we ought to be anticipating the day of the Lord when God's judgment would be unleashed in an unrestrained way like never seen before on this earth. Just notice when that day comes, God calls himself a witness, a witness, but also he's the one making the decision that that word there is mishpat, the often used Hebrew word for justice or decision when the reward for either good or evil is rendered to an individual or the decision to give them what they deserve is rendered, is made. That's the same word. So here God is functioning in two roles when his justice is delivered. He is both the witness and the judge. He gives the decision and he brings the evidence. And woe to any sinner who has God the judge also as God the witness against them. You don't want God as your judge and witness bringing evidence and a decision against you. The one who possesses all knowledge and all authority brings all the necessary evidence. He's aware of every motive, every deed, every word, every thought. And then he renders a decision. God is both of these things on 
the day of the Lord when he causes his justice to rain down on mankind. And then we get the, the purpose of God's justice subsequent to this, to assemble nations, to pour out on them all my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. So really you get three purposes here, to destroy nations, to exhaust wrath, and to prove his own zeal. God will accomplish all of those things on the day of the Lord when his justice is rendered. He will destroy nations, he will exhaust his own wrath, and he will prove his own zeal for his own name. So taking these one at a time, to gather nations, his decision is to do this, to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms. Here, that word uh, gather is the same word again that we've seen. Zephaniah is using, again, similar language, not as easily discerned in the English text, but that word gather is the same word that he used in chapter 1, verse 2, that gets translated remove if you're reading the New American Standard Bible. I will completely remove. It's a way of uh, emphatically and saying utterly that something will happen. And so you get the same verb, asaf, twice, just repeated. And so it gets translated completely remove instead of remove, remove. It's like really remove entirely remove. And this is just what's being repeated here in verse eight to gather nations in the sense of gathering for the purpose of removal or destruction. This is what he's going to do with every nation under heaven, America included to assemble kingdoms. Another way of saying the same thing to actually exhaust his wrath or pour out on them his indignation. All, you'll notice in verse 8, not some, but all. This is a completion, a complete pouring out of the burning anger of God that proves his zeal to defend his own honor. We've seen this uh, other places in Scripture. Let me just point you to a couple other places that anticipate this same awful event that actually has kingdoms or nations, peoples in view. Um, It's fresh on my own mind because I just preached it not too long ago. Go back to Psalm 46. In Psalm 46, the sons of Korah anticipate this same event when God unleashes wrath on the world But for God's people, when that time comes, he proves to be their refuge. And so they don't fear. But just notice in Psalm 46, verse 6 in particular, the similarity of language. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. So here, the the same event, I believe, the day of the Lord, uh, the tribulation, is in view when God, with a word, with simply an utterance of his divine decree to let it happen, this is the result. Kingdoms tottered. They proved unstable. They could not stand. Again, he assembled kingdoms and poured out his indignation on them. And here again, all his burning anger. We looked at what came before. Let's just fast forward to future or subsequent revelation to Zephaniah. Go to Revelation 6 and we'll just look at a few references here. Is there a time coming when God really unleashes all his wrath, what can, what can be described as a completion of his wrath on the world? 
Just notice in Revelation 6, here you have the Apostle John writing 600 years after Zephaniah of the same event. And in verse 17, he even quotes, if you will, puts words in the inhabitants' mouths at that time. Here's what they say in verses 16 and 17. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? This is when the the beginning, really, the, the sixth seal is broken. So this is the beginning of the day of the Lord, the beginning of the day of the Lord's wrath. And already it's unbearable. Who can stand in this day? And God is just getting started. There's another seal that gets opened. Just fast forward to chapter 15. Once the seventh seal is opened, there are trumpets blown. That seven trumpets initiates or includes seven more judgments subsequent to the seals. And then you have seven bowls, another series of subsequent judgments that are unleashed from heaven on the world. And look at verse 1 in chapter 15 of Revelation. Here's the, here's the, the sentiment. Then John says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them, these plagues, the wrath of God is finished. And then these judgments unfold. Fast forward to chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And then verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. What's done? Well, the judgments, the wrath of God. Is done by, by the time you get to the end of these three series of judgments, the seventh bowl is the final one, and it's called done, finished. There's a completion to God's wrath coming upon the world in that day. And so back in Zephaniah, verse 8, when God declares that he is assembling kingdoms, gathering nations to pour out on them all his burning anger, That's the way it should be taken. All his burning anger. This is God proving that he will not be mocked. All of the centuries that God's people since this time, even beforehand, and all throughout church history, when the church has had this message saying to a lost and dying world, God's wrath is coming. God's wrath is coming. There is a kingdom coming. You must repent if you would escape wrath. You must believe if you would enter into that kingdom. And it's, that still hasn't happened. That's our message. That still hasn't happened. And the world mocks and says, yeah, right. There is no wrath. There is no danger. Peace and safety. They feel at ease. God will defend his own word, his own name, his own faithfulness when he finally brings about that day and unbelievers are caught unawares experiencing the unleashing of the wrath of God. And this is God's justice. This is perfectly right for God to unleash his wrath on sinners in this way. Well, subsequent to that event on that day, there's something else that God intends to bring about. And that's in verse 9 and 10. He says, for then, 
at that time, on that day, I will give to the peoples, notice you have a plurality of peoples, a plurality of nations, this, purified lips, <laughs> that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to shoulder. This anticipates the second event. This is God's worship. Not only will God's justice come, but one day God's worship will also come. That's what's being described in these verses. Just notice the peoples, subsequent to God's wrath, now nations get purified lips. Perfected lips to do this. Call on the name of Yahweh and then for this purpose, to serve him shoulder to shoulder. So just in, in, in these verses, you have really three things in view. Sincere praise, unified service, and holy offerings. Sincere praise, unified service, and holy offerings. First, sincere praise, the purified lips, is not envisioning a universal language so much as it is uh, what's actually described in the, the words that follow, it's a calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. This is uh, essentially men and women depending on God's character. That's what his name signifies. It's his character, his reputation, and they actually call on it or entrust themselves to it. Just two references uh, perhaps for you, because this comes up later in the passage, uh, two helpful references to think about the name of the Lord are Exodus 34, verse 5, and Proverbs 18, 10. Let me just direct your attention briefly uh, to these things. In Exodus 34, 5 and following, we get God declaring his own name. So he doesn't leave it a mystery. He doesn't leave us guessing. He just tells us, tells Moses for the sake of not destroying Israel, who he is, and he calls it his name. Look at Exodus 34. I'll begin reading at verse 5. You have the Lord himself descending in the cloud, and he stood with him there, stood with Moses there, and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And what did he proclaim when he proclaimed his name? Yahweh himself, this would be in the context, in the flesh, declaring or making known his own name. Well, verse 6, he passed before Moses, and this is what he proclaimed when he proclaimed his name. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. That is God's name. He's making his character known. Mercy, grace, patience, Forgiveness, because he is abundant in steadfast love and faithfulness, but he's also just. That's his character. Proverbs 18.10 says that the righteous do something with this character, this name of Yahweh. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. So God's name, his reputation, his being everything we just read about is actually, truly a strong tower. It is a place of refuge and safety for all those who believe God. So the person who is righteous, who believes God, who entrusts himself to God, does just that. He runs into God's name, God's character. That's a description of entrustment. 
to say, yes, God, I agree with you about who you say you are, so I am going to entrust myself to you. I'm running to you as my only refuge and place of safety and salvation. And guess what? They're not disappointed. They are actually safe. They find safety. He does prove to be a refuge to those who believe that he is a refuge. And so when Zephaniah describes this calling on the name of the Lord, that is a sincere praise. Obviously, the people there are believing God and actually calling on him in in a dependent way. And they experience the salvation of the Lord. Now, they're not just calling on his name, finding safety for the sake of the safety itself, but this is for something further that Zephaniah describes in verse 9, to do this, serve him shoulder to shoulder. So the peoples, plural, nations, kingdoms, serve him in a unified way with one shoulder. That means they bear willingly the yoke of the Lord. That's what is sort of the language lends itself to this uh, bearing a burden like an animal that would wear a yoke, right, to, to serve with the shoulder. But they do this with one shoulder or a shoulder to shoulder in a unified way. They're right in step with each other. This has never happened before since the nations have existed. Uh, maybe the Tower of Babel was the last time, but that was not serving God, serving self in a unified way against God. Here, under the authority of God, they serve shoulder to shoulder. So there will be no more denominations within Christendom. There will be no more religions across the world, but altogether, the nations will agree in who God is and how he ought to be worshiped. If you want to see that day, then you must be what we've already seen in Zephaniah, humble. You must be the humble one to see that day. Believing God, entrusting yourself to him, submitting to his authority. Notice in verse 10, from the beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones will bring my offerings. So this would have been uh, in the actual, probably, nation of Ethiopia. We've already seen Ethiopia mentioned uh, once in chapter 2, verse 12. His sword has finally come. The sinners there have been slain, slain. But here we see that still people are coming from the nation to bring God's own gifts. Again, agreeing with the way that God himself says he ought to be worshipped they bring him those offerings. They're called his worshipers. So not just within Israel, but from beyond, you get this happening. This is the the kingdom, the king, he's here, and all of the nations stream into the, the central place of worship to bring God his offerings. That'll get described further at the end of this book. We'll get to that next time. But this is a glimpse of what's coming. The third event also happens when subsequent to God's justice, but contemporary with that second event, God's worship, we get event three, Zion's cleansing. Zion's cleansing in verse 11. Zion's cleansing. Notice in verse 11, again, in that day, so same period of time, you, you will feel no shame. This is a feminine singular pronoun. So it's like saying she will feel no shame, but from the second person perspective, you, female, will not do this. And that begs the question, who's the you in view then? He's not talking about groups of people, 
but you, well, the second or the last time we saw this same pronoun, the second person feminine singular reference, was all the way back in verse 7. When God said, I said, surely you will revere me, except instruction. You remember who he was talking to? He's talking to Jerusalem in verse 1 of chapter 3. The rebellious and defiled, tyrannical city is what was in view. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. Here, God returns to speak again a word to that city, but says there, there will be a day coming when the words appropriate to that city will be completely different than what we already saw. Now, where she used to be this shameless place, defiled place, impure, here she will feel no shame. Zion or Jerusalem will feel no shame, and here's why. All of her deeds by which she rebelled against Yahweh she won't feel shame for them, for then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones. Wow. The reason that Jerusalem will have no shame to mention is because God has removed every cause, shameful cause, that exists. Every sinner to be found in Jerusalem, not trusting in God, not drawing near to her God, they're gone. God's wrath has gotten rid of them, and all that's left is opposite proud, exalting ones, or what's called in verse 12, a humble, lowly people. That's what's left. So that's why Jerusalem will experience no shame, because she will be inhabited by a humble, lowly people. He says here at the end of verse 11, you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. Jerusalem, the city situated on Mount Zion would never be marked again by pride or haughtiness. This would indeed be his holy mountain, not just set apart because God chose it as he did so long ago, but set apart because of the people who dwell there. The holy mountain would now be inhabited by a holy people. Can I just remind you again from Psalm 15 that this is what was always prophesied. God's holy set apart place was destined to be inhabited by God's set apart holy people. Psalm 15 says this. O oh, Yahweh, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill? So who current and future has rights to be here on the place that God has chosen, Zion, in Jerusalem? One answer, several descriptions. Verse 2, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken, i.e. removed ultimately from the land. He will one day inhabit the kingdom when it finally comes. And here you have Zephaniah articulating the same thing. The same principle is that Zion will be cleansed of every shameful, proud person. And all that will be left is humble, lowly people. So you have God's justice coming on the day of the Lord, God's worship coming on the day of the Lord, and Zion's cleansing coming in this period of time known as the day of the Lord. And then you have two more events, both with respect to Israel. Event number four is Israel's purification. Israel's purification. 
verse, verses 12 and 13 depict Israel's purification. Again, verse 12, I will leave among you, leave among you. That means it's what's left, the remnant. I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh, as we've already seen. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Or if you're in my small group, we talked about this on Tuesday from Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, that the very word of the Lord proves true. Every single word of God proves true. He is a refuge or a shield, rather, to those who take refuge in him. Again, you have the same language used as taking refuge in God himself. These are a believing people. So here you have the people identified and described. They're identified as the remnant or what's left, right? Those who remain. But they're described as a humble people, a lowly people, a believing people, a perfect people, and an honest people. You have each of these things mentioned. First, a humble people. This is what we've been talking about. This is who Zephaniah was referencing in chapter 2, verse 3. Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth, who do his ordinances or carry out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. That humble or humility word is the same one here. They're the ones that get to remain in the land after God's wrath comes. And don't forget, they've been protected. They escape God's wrath, according to chapter 2, verse 3. You will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger, and that perhaps is the word of hope, right? So there's hope that you will be hidden, will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger if you are humble, and here we see the wrath of God is passed. God is being worshiped. Zion has been cleansed. Israel has been purified. And those who get to inhabit the land on that day, lo and behold, are the humble. They've escaped wrath. They've experienced purification. There are lowly people. Um, this is your word that just means poor they're poor. It has nothing to do with wealth. But what this does mean is the same way that Jesus used this word, uh, this language, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're the poor in spirit. This is what uh, Eric described this morning in communion. They're the ones who see themselves like that tax collector, bankrupt, they have nothing to bring to God spiritually. When it comes to the spiritual arena, they're bankrupt. They're poor. They need help. That's why this is accompanied by a humble spirit. They're a believing people because they take refuge in the name of the Lord. They actually flee to him. They believe him. They entrust themselves to him. And just notice in verse 13, this remnant that's in view, they're a perfect people. It says in verse 13, they will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. So the honesty being a perfect honesty just proves the point that they're a perfected people. James 3.2 says that we sin in many ways, in various ways. Whoever does not stumble in his speech is a perfect man. So here, if you have perfected speech, no more lies, the doing of no more wrong, no deceit to be found coming from their speech, then you can count on the rest of them being perfected. And just notice this, in, when it says they do no wrong, that phrase, they do no wrong, is the same phrase that you can find in verse 5 of chapter 3. But here, the doing of no wrong or no injustice, same word there, same phrase, 
is a reference not to they, Israel, but he, Yahweh. In verse 5, Zephaniah said, Yahweh is righteous within her. He will do no wrong or he will do no injustice. And so here, what you have pictured is the people of God look exactly like their God. Just as Yahweh does no wrong, now they are just like him. This is glorification. The people, just like God, do no wrong, do no more injustice. So here, Israel, the believing remnant, has been glorified. They are just like God. And finally, the fifth and final event coming about after God's justice on the day of the Lord is finally event five, Israel's rest. Israel's rest, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. That's a description of biblical rest. First, let's deal with the the conjunction there, for. It makes it sound, if you just thought, oh, every time I see for or because, it's giving a reason. Uh, This, if it was taken that way, because or for they will feed and lie down with no one to make it tremble. It sounds like they've been glorified because they finally have no more enemies or because they've finally been given rest. That's not the reason for the perfection. That's not the reason for the glorification. Um, Just taking, for example, that last statement with no one to make them tremble. Israel was not wicked. They didn't continue in their stubborn-hearted rebellion against God because of all of the enemies around them. So that if we could finally just get rid of our enemies, then we would finally obey God. Right? That's not, that, that was never Israel's problem. So the four should not be taken as a, an explanatory or causal conjunction there but rather uh, one sense to take this same Hebrew word, key, is temporal. That means it's a marker of time. So it indicates a time reference when what's described in following is happening at the same time as what just came before. So the relationship to the beginning of verse 13 and the end of verse 13 is to say they happen subsequent or contemporary. They're happening at the same time. So a better way to translate that would be when. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths when they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. These events, Israel's purification and Israel's rest will happen at the same time. And this should not be a surprise Just flip back to Leviticus 26, because in the law of Moses, if Israel was going to experience rest, then they also had to maintain purity. So these things were always intended to go hand in hand. Israel's purification or purity and Israel's rest. The rest is the blessing the, their being pure is something that they were bound to, to practice. And even in the law of Moses, we see that they could not have one without the other. They could not get God's blessing apart from their own obedience. Look at 26 of Leviticus verse 1. God requires this. You shall make for yourselves no idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figure, a figured stone in your land to bow down to it. For I, Yahweh, I am Yahweh, your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. If you walk, notice the condition there in verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, i.e. do his ordinances. Verse 4, then I shall give you rains in your season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, 
Your threshing will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. So this unending sowing, reaping, gathering, sowing, reaping, gathering, the land's always producing because you've been obedient and God is yielding produce, blessing you with the, the fruit of the land. Notice, continuing on in verse 5, you will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. That is what Zephaniah is quoting. You will feed and lie down with no one to make you tremble or make them tremble. So the thing that Moses prophesied about that God would do if the people were obedient, Zephaniah says, will actually be fulfilled. God will bring it about in the midst of an obedient, perfected people. This day is coming. This day of the Lord is coming. Israel will finally be obedient. They are not today, still but they will one day be when God removes the sinners, converts some of them, the remnant, and then eventually perfects the remnant on this day of the Lord. That's the timing of Israel's rest. It will coincide with Israel's eventual obedience. And the implications of this day are really uh, a rest in work and a rest from war. Those two things, when you, if you just traced out uh, a biblical theology of this rest that's been anticipated, that would kind of capture the main ideas involved in biblical rest and Israel's rest. A rest from work, the toil, the curse that God subjected all of creation to. And now you have to make things grow out of the ground or you have to labor to provide for yourself. Those days would be no more. And a rest from war for Israel. Just notice, just two, two references, Genesis 5, 28 through 29, and then Joshua 23, verse 1. You'll get both of those things, work and war, in view. In Genesis 5, Noah's father, Lamech, names him Noah, saying, God will give us rest, anticipating it being through Noah. So he'll give us rest from the work of our hands and from the toil of the ground that God has cursed. Well, Noah didn't give rest, but it was being anticipated even then. The curse is upon us. When will this be no more? And then Joshua, he gathers at the end of his life, the elders and the writer there says that God had given them rest from all of their enemies all around. And that was rest because he put down their enemies. They defeated their enemies. So you have essentially this period or time, this event when Israel would finally be given rest, it's captured with those two things. They can feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. So uh, a, a reference essentially to Israel being able to enjoy the, the land finally and to be able to do it apart from any enemies. And we'll see in a few verses why that is. God will be in their midst a victorious warrior. He has subdued all of their enemies. And so they have nothing else to fear ever again because their king is finally ruling in the midst of them. This is what Zephaniah is anticipating, and this is what he's teaching us to anticipate. Do you think about the, this, these events, about this day coming? Do you think about a day of wrath that's coming on the world from which you hope to be rescued? Do you think about God's worship coming one day when there will be no more division. God's people will perfectly worship him in truth or Zion's cleansing. And that draws our attention to a specific place on the map, Jerusalem, 
Do you anticipate Jerusalem being perfected, finally being what God has always intended? Or Israel, now a specific nation, being glorified, dwelling comfortably in the land that God gave to them by right, and all of the other Old Testament saints? I appreciated the the series that Steve just finished bringing us through an equipping hour. And he said this morning in that equipping hour, uh, fix your hope on the details. Fix your hope on the details. These details matter. Don't just spiritualize or skip over the details. These things matter for your own ability to wait well. Again, if you want to see this day, if you want to be a part of these phenomenal events, to escape wrath, to experience the worship of the Lord, him dwelling in the midst finally of his people, in the the man Jesus Christ, if you want to see that kingdom come, you have to be today a humble, lowly people, not arrogant, not seeking to leverage whatever you think might be your own spiritual resources on your own, You must entrust yourself fully to the Lord today or else you will not see that day. You might see wrath, not the kingdom coming. Let me just point us to one New Testament passage that holds out the same hope. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. We'll actually start in Hebrews 2 and just quickly look at how This amazing preacher, writer, ties tons of Old Testament theology together that actually he's calling these things or just ties them neatly together in this theology of rest. Just notice in Hebrews 2, Chapter 5, or verse 5, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 5, the author says, For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. I remember long ago reading and even memorizing this, and every time I got to verse 5, I thought, what world has he even been talking about? He thinks he's been talking about a world coming what, where? And then I would go back from verse one of chapter one and just reread, and I was just missing it for a long time. Well, he has been talking about this world to come, just perhaps not in the way my uninformed mind was expecting him to. Notice in chapter one, verse eight, but of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is about Jesus. God says these things. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. That's the world coming, his kingdom. What about in verse 14? He says about angels that they are all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will, that's future, inherit salvation. He's got ultimate salvation in view, salvation coming when a kingdom finally arrives. And then he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. What, what was being heard by this New Testament audience from John the Baptist, from Jesus, from Jesus' apostles, and he even says in verse 4 that God testified to that message being spoken by those preachers, those apostles, he used signs, wonders, various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will to verify the message of what? A kingdom coming, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It was a kingdom, uh, it was a, a message similar to what we've heard in Zephaniah. A kingdom's coming, Wrath is coming before that kingdom. You must repent and believe God, humble yourself before him if you want to see that day. Escape wrath and see that day. Same message. 
Well, how does this author tie all of that in when it comes to rest? Look at chapter 3, verse 12. We're instructed to take care that there be not be in any of us an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they, heard, when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Just pause for a second. Notice in verse 16, they heard all of them. But with them, verse 17, he was angry because they did what? Sinned. Verse 18, they didn't enter his rest. That is the land, the fulfillment of his promises, where that, the fulfillment of his promises would happen because those sinners, those who sinned, were also, verse 18, disobedient. But verse 19 says they were not able to enter because of not sin, not disobedience, not hard-heartedness, unbelief. They're all, they're all, it's a package deal. Sin, unbelief, and disobedience. You want to know if you believe? Do you put off sin? Do you cease resisting the Lord and, and do you stop being disobedient? Well, even for this New Testament audience, rest was still coming. Notice in verse one of chapter four, again, the the command to fear, let us fear then, therefore, while a promise remains of entering his rest. Any one of you, lest any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith. And those who heard rest, there is still a promise of rest. It was the same for Joshua's generation, gener generation. There was a promise of rest. They didn't get it because of unbelief. Even in David's time, he wrote Psalm 95 saying today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because David's generation did not get the rest that was promised. And then in Jesus' day and in Paul's day and in the apostles' day, they still anticipated the same kingdom, the same rest to come. And so this New Testament audience is told, fear, beware, be careful, lest in you there is an evil, unbelieving heart that will do what those other generations found out. They failed to enter his rest. They did not inherit the promises because... Their hearing was not united by faith. We are a people, again, hearing God's word, just like all of those subsequent generations. We will not enter God's rest unless the words that you're hearing are united with a heart of faith. So then, you hearing these words, children and adults included, you must believe these promises that are being declared by the Lord. Everything that we have heard from Zephaniah, you must believe. You must humble yourself, not trust your own understanding, not lean on your own understanding, not be wise in your own eyes. If you persist in rebellion to God, then you are doing those things. You must stop. And believe God so that you escape the wrath to come and eventually experience the rest that he's anticipating. Do you believe God? Do, have you humbled yourself under his mighty hand to entrust him, to entrust your own soul to him? You must do that. Children in the room, you, are, you do not get a get out of jail free card because of your age. Ask your parents. Ask your parents. 
Do you think I believe God? Do I show fruit of saving faith that I've humbled myself under God's mighty hand? And if you're afraid to ask them, then perhaps you already know the answer. Adults, ask your children, do we live like men and women who are humble before the Lord? And if you're afraid to ask your children, then maybe you already have the answer to that question. These are precious promises worthy of being believed. If you, by faith, without seeing the the fulfillment of these promises, anticipate them like all of the other faithful saints of old, you will not be disappointed. I can assure you, you will not be disappointed because God has spoken clearly about these things and he will not lie. He will be faithful. He will resurrect all of the saints who have died without receiving the promises and he will give them one day. Believe God. Let's pray. God, thank you for these truths, even promises that we eagerly, anxiously await to inherit a kingdom and escape from your wrath. What more could we ask for in this life but to have these promises given to us and the character of your own faithfulness to back them up? I pray, God, that you would help us to live as a people who believe these things, that we would even be eager to draw near to one another where we see a stumbling or a waffling as we walk this path, run the race that you've laid before us. Help us to help each other so that we all will see this day and rejoice together in the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.